Halo. Halo. Halo, halo. 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 Now it works. Any problem? Any problem while hearing me? Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yes, it's clear. Clear? Okay. Great. Uh, okay, so we should start now. Uh, well, first, uh, several logistics stuff. Uh, first of all, we're going to have our midterm tonight from 7 p.m. to 7 p.m. tomorrow, okay? So you have 24 hours to finish this, uh, well, this exam. Uh, totally, I think you have eight, well, seven problems plus uh, one bonus problem. And uh, well, good luck. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's okay. I think it's easy. Well, not, not really easy, but it's okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, please, uh, I didn't write it on the exam paper, but please uh, don't, don't communicate with each other don't talk to each other, don't search the internet, and uh, well, other than that, you can do whatever you want, okay? Uh, you cannot get some other help from some, well, live person, some, from some real person, okay? You can get help from your textbook, from arting, but not other persons, not Google, not, uh, well, by do or be, okay? Not Warframe Alpha, and, uh, not mess over, well, mess over stocks, this kind of thing, no, okay? And uh, you are going to, I'll, I'll ask you to sign a uh, honor code so that you will, yeah, you'll guarantee that uh, you'll be honest. Uh, and uh, another thing is, uh, I talked to Masha and uh, Masha says that we are not, we cannot uh, schedule our final exam on Saturday. So I have to change it to uh, from just as a midterm from Thursday 7 p.m. to uh, Friday 7 p.m. So I change it uh, a little bit. Hopefully you still get enough time and uh, you don't have any conflict. If you have any problems about the finals, uh, final schedule, please let me know, okay? Uh, I think that's or any question? about your midterm or final? Any question? Um, well, the, well, the questions in uh, like bonus homework covered. No, no, no. Bonus homework is still bonus homework, right? So I'll not assume you know anything about your bonus homework. I will not assume anything, uh, you know, anything about UFD or Euclidean domain or this kind of thing, okay? But of course, we mentioned the PID yesterday, well, on, on Tuesday. So, uh, well, I assume you know what is a principal ideal domain, okay? Any other question? No. Okay, so let's start for today's class. Uh, just to remind you, last time we discussed about, well, the, the ring homomorphism. The ring homomorphism, and uh, we discussed a very important stuff that is, that is, uh, well, the first isomorphism theorem, which is, Suppose you have an onto map, a surjective, phi from R to S, two rings. Phi is a homomorphism, well, ring homomorphism. Then 
uh, what you do have is then what we do have is well uh, if you use r modulus this kernel of c it is well isomorphic to s okay and uh, today first uh, let, let me finish this part and tell you what is uh, where well, we have the first isomorphism theorem then i will tell you what is a second and third isomorphism theorem okay first let's see what is uh, second awesome well, isomorphism theorem Okay, uh, for the second isomorphism theorem, it basically tell you something about, uh, well, the operation. The first one tell you, uh, well, the operations or the isomorphic of, uh, of between rings. The second one tells you something about the operations between ideals and do the homomorph homomorphism. That is, well, suppose you have a ring, commutative ring. Then, well, let's say I1 and I2 are both ideals. Okay. Then, what we have is if you try to take some operation of these two ideals, you can get some equations. This equation is if you take the addition of two ideals. As we mentioned, what is addition of two ideals? That means you, you take one element from one and take another one from this I2 and then take the addition. And all these kind of uh, well, elements are the uh, forms of set and it becomes another ideal, which is I1 plus I2. This one will modular I2 is isomorphic to I1 modulus i1 intersect i2 <clears throat> okay uh, this is uh well this is not so clear for us at this moment uh, i'll give you examples see what does that mean okay for instance we are in z okay we are in z the integers and then let's say okay then z is a pid so, well, we can take two ideals. We have to take two ideals to be A times Z and uh, the second one to be B times Z. Okay? And then we can check what's the right-hand side, what's the left-hand side. The right-hand side becomes I1 plus I2. I1 plus I2, we say that well, if you have two ideals, this principal ideals, what is I1 plus I2? Anybody know? Anyone? What is I1? What is AZ plus BZ? Well, it's not A plus BZ, right? What is AZ plus BZ? Hmm? Any idea? It's like the the, the set like M A plus N B Z. Yes. So what's that set? The the set of the greatest common divisor. Of, yes. It's of B C D of A B times, right? It's always a principal ideal, so it must be something times. Z. And then you find that, okay, it's actually GCD times. Then how about I1 intersect I2? This is also something we mentioned last time. If you have AZ, all the multiple of, uh, all the multiple of A intersect all the multiple of B, what do you get? The least common multiplier of A, B. Yes. The least uh, common multiplier of AB times Z. Okay, 
So what does this equation tell us? This equation simply tell us GCD a B of Z models uh, this uh, well BZ is isomorphic to AZ models the least common multiplier of A B. Well, this doesn't really look uh, something that we're familiar with, right? However, what I claim is, well, if you try to calculate the element of both sides, then you'll see that this actually, this equation actually tell us something that we already know. Okay? So what, how many elements does the right-hand side have? Well, the right hand side, if you do not have this GCD, if it is Z over BZ, then that means ZB, right? On ZB, it has only B elements. But now it becomes GCD ABZ over BZ. Then how many elements do you have on this caution ring? Okay, what does that mean? Is it B divided GCD AB? Yes, that's right. Because that simply means you try to look at this ZB and choose those who is a multiple of GCD AB, right? Then, of course, that gives you only B over GCD AB, that amount of element. Similarly, the right hand side is, uh, well, it has LCM AB divided by A, this amount of element, right? Those two guys are isomorphic to each other. That means the amount of element also equal. So this can tell us a very, well, maybe not surprising, but from here is actually surprising. It tells us an equation about AB and GCD LCM. Okay, so A times B is actually equals to the greatest common divisor times uh, of AB times the least common multiplier of AB. Okay, so this can be seen as an example to use the second isomorphism theorem to prove something. Okay. And uh, as long as you have two ideals on a ring, then you can always play with them and then you can find some connection between them. Okay? So let's try to prove the second isomorphism theorem and see, well, this proof can be seen as an application of the first isomorphism theorem we mentioned last time, this one. Okay, uh, so if you want to use the first isomorphism theorem, then probably you want to have some idea, well, some, some kind of ring, for instance, this one or this one, and then you find a map from this one to this ring or from this I1 to this ring. Then you try to find the kernel, which will happen to be this one, then you are done. Okay, so let's try to prove that if you set up a homomorphism from I1 to I1 plus I2 over I2, then you may find this homomorphism is an onto and the kernel is exactly I1 intersect I2. Then by the first isomorphism theorem, we are done. Okay? Let's try to build this uh, well fee. This fee is actually a chronic fee, which is, uh, well, it has to be like that and you don't need to do any trick on this. So let's see. So phi, it shifts from I1 to I1 plus I2 over I2. So this is a caution ring, right? If it is a caution ring, then probably will eventually you will get some equivalent class, equivalent class on I1 plus I2. Right? So how can we use, uh, how can we make this map? For instance, if you have an A in I1, then 
what's, what should be the image of phi A? Well, it should be first on I1 plus I2. Second, it should be an equivalent class. So which means the easiest one we should find is A plus I2. Here, A plus I2 is what? Well, A plus I2 is just a, a shortcut of A bar, which is the equivalent class with representative element A on this quotient ring. Okay, I'll use this notation to denote this uh, well equivalent class of the quotient ring. And uh, then you do have a home where well, you do have a map from I1 to I1 plus I2 over I2. Okay. Then the next question is, you have to show first, it's a homomorphism. Second, it's an onto homomorphism. And third, it's kernel is equals to I1 intersect I2. Right? So first, well, it is an homomorphism. This is pretty easy to check. Actually, as long as this is a well-defined map, it is uh, well, automatically a homomorphism because it's more or less like a projection, okay? And second, it's easy to check. It's actually an onto, it's a surjective. Why is that? Well, because for any class on this set, for any equivalent class on this set, it must be able to write an as, well, it must have a representative element uh, as, a, as, a, as an addition of two elements, one from I1, one from I2. For any B on this I1 plus I2, over I2, it is actually B is actually an equivalent class. And uh, well, if you try to dig, if you try to find what is B, then B must be able to, you must be able to write B as a B1 plus B2. Although this decomposition is not unique, but you're still able to write, there exists a B1 in I1, B2 in I2, such that B is, in, is equals to B1 plus B2. It may not be unique, but then we may find that, okay, the pre-image of B is actually, well, contains, uh, contains uh, well, contains B1, right? B1 is actually in the pre-image of B, and uh, which means VB1 is equals to B as an equivalent class. Okay, so phi is on two. It's a surjective. And the last thing is you have to find what is a kernel of phi. So what is a kernel of phi? As I see, it belongs to the kernel of phi. Then first, we know that C must be in I1, of course, because you are in I1, okay? And second, well, phi c is equals to zero plus i2. That means c must be in i2 as well, right? So that means, okay, c is in i1 intercept with i2. Then we are done. By first isomorphism theorem, we are done. Okay. Any question? Drew, please repeat what did you, what did you done for the for this for checking it's onto? Well, this uh, there is a homomorphism that is an onto homomorphism, right? And uh, we know that the kernel is actually I one intersect with I two. Then the first isomorphism theorem say that you use the domain, will modulus the kernel, 
is uh, isomorphic to your image. Uh, I, I'm wondering, like, how did you prove it, that this is onto? How to prove this is onto? So you see, for any B, any equivalent class B on this set, right? We we can choose a representative the element B such that it's equals to B1 plus B2, where B1 is in I1 and B2 is in I2. This is the definition, right? And then we know that then phi B1 is actually equals to this equivalent class with representative element B. So since B is arbitrary equivalent class, so B so phi is onto. Okay. Then, yeah. Sure. Any other question? Any other question? Mm -hmm. So, if no more question, then let's move on. This is for the so-called the second isomorphism theorem. It's uh, it can be seen as application of the isom well, of the first isomorphism theorem. But of course, we will have the third one. It is so-called the third isomorphism theorem. Okay. Well, the previous one, the second one, it just tell you you have two ideals, and then you can do, you can run some operations of these two ideals. The third one is more restricted. It tells you something uh, about, uh, well, the ideals that is, uh, well, one is inside another. Okay. Let's say we have an R is a ring, commutative ring. And uh, let's say J is in I. Both J and I are ideals of R. Okay. Then what we can say is, well, you have a bigger one. You have a smaller one. The bigger one more to the smaller one well, first, it's an ideal, so it's actually, a, it has a ring structure. It's a subring as well, right? So, which means I modulus J is also a subring, but also, well, it's actually an ideal of uh, R over J. Now, which means if you modulus uh, this R and I both by J, Okay, then you still get an, well, this one is an ideal of the other one. Moreover, if you modulate uh, R by J and then, well, let's write it this way, divide by, again, modulus this ideal, what you will get is this J can actually cancel. What you will get is R over I as a caution rate. Well, this means the caution we define is really nice operation because you can cancel the top and the bottom in some sense. Okay. Professor? Mm -hmm. Question? Oh, uh, yeah. Before we move on, I still have a second isomorphism theorem. Of course. Yeah. You just proved that any 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 element from the kernel of the C, of C is, um, is, is, is also an element of the of the intersection of those I, I1 and I2. Mm -hmm. I think you still then, need to... Yeah, you're right. We still need to say phi I1 intersect I2 is actually zero, right? Yeah. And uh, of course that is true because for any element in I1 intersect with I2, phi this element is equals to, well, this element plus I2, which equals to I2, zero plus I2. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So it's actually the curve. You're right. Thank you. Any other question? 
Then let's move on to this third one. So you have that, you know, this is a very good relation. It says that if you have two ideals, if you have an ideal, which is a common ideal of both R and I, then if you modulus this ideal, both R and I, then you can actually cancel them. Okay? This is an interesting well, proposition about the ideals. So, well, as an example, maybe it's not a very good example, but sometimes you may try to study, uh, well, for instance, on Z12, on Z12. On Z12. What can we say about all the elements in Z12, which is both in Z12 and also is in, well, it's also a multiple of six. Uh, sorry. Uh, let's uh, write it this way. Z12 divided by Z, well, 6Z, caution, well, 12Z. So what is the uh, element in Z12? Well, such that it's actually also a multiple of six. And we want to discuss this kind of caution ring. And we want to discuss, well, what does this caution ring has a relation with this, uh, well, the original ring Z, Z12, right? And from the second, uh, from this uh, set third, third isomorphism theorem, what we know is Z12 is actually Z over, well, 12Z. And if you divide 6Z over 12Z, it's actually equals to Z6. Okay, so that sounds very complicated, but after all, you're just are trying to figure out what's on Z6. The equivalent class is basically uh, some element on Z6, okay? Uh, so I'm not provide more examples on this third isomorphism theorem, but you will see one example, one very interesting example uh, on your midterm, okay, that you will see tonight. By the way, uh, uh, I forgot to mention one last thing about logistic, which is uh, I, I will have another office hour uh, right after class today from 2.30 to 3.30. Meanwhile, I will hold the last minute help from six to seven. Remember, we will have the midterm at seven. So I'll be here six to seven as well, okay? So let's prove this third isomorphism theorem, okay? How can we prove it? Again, if you, if you try to prove it, you still need to try to use the first isomorphic theorem, first isomorphism theorem, because that's the only thing or the most important thing we have learned about the ring homomorph or ring isomorphic, okay? So again, let's try to find a map, for instance, from here to here, because this guy is too complicated. This whole thing is too complicated. It's very hard to imagine. So let's try to find a map, a homomorphism from here to here. Then we find this kernel is this one, then we're done. Okay? So let's try to see what happens if you, uh, if you have this uh, phi from R over G, J to R over I. What kind of phi we should get? Okay? Then we should be careful because then we have both the image and the pre image are uh, uh, cautionary, right? So phi should act on some equivalent class, say A plus J. And uh, we want to map it to something on this equivalent class. So probably what we want to map is, well, A plus I. This A is nothing but just some element on R, okay? Then we try to map from one equivalent class to another equivalent class. We have to check whether this kind of map is a well-defined map or not, which means 
whether it depends on the representative element we choose or not. So does it depend? Well, for instance, if I choose an A on this, um, on this equivalent class, maybe there is another B on this equivalent class so that A plus J is equals to B plus J. Okay. Then can we say that, well, we eventually get this, uh, well, A plus I equals to B plus I, which means uh, our, well, our output is the same if you have the input to be the same. Okay, let's check, okay? So A plus J, uh, A plus J, B plus J, then we must have the equivalent class of A plus I. Hmm. A plus I, I is slightly bigger, right? So you have A plus this is J, and I is slightly bigger, okay? So if you A has something that outside of this J, A has something outside of this J, then this I can actually eat more from A, right? But we know that B and A outside from J, they are the same. Then of course, if you eat more, from I, then A and B are still the same, okay? Or on the language of, uh, of our equivalent class, A plus J is uh, equals to B plus J, that means A minus B I in J. I is a bigger set of J, so of course A minus B is in I. So that means, a plus I is equals to B plus I as well. Okay, this is idea. This is how you show it. So which means this map phi is actually a well-defined map. It doesn't depend on what representative element you choose. Okay, so phi is well defined. Then, how about well whether phi is a homomorphism or not? Well, you can check that. It's easy to check. Phi is also a homomorphism. Well, this is really easy because uh, this is only something like a projection. Okay, and the uh, last thing, well, then the next thing is we have to check V is onto. Well, how can we check V is onto? Well, suppose you have some element on this set, right? Suppose B, well, suppose C plus I is in this, uh, it's an equivalent class on this set. Okay, then we know that C, well, it's a, C is an element in R, right? Then, of course, we can put this equivalent class, well, we can map this C plus J, this equivalent class to C plus I. So this is not a problem. Onto part is quite easy. Then the last thing we need to check is uh, we need to check this map has a kernel, which kernel is I over J. What is the kernel of V? Well, so let's see, what can we say about the kernel of, J, of V? If you have an element, let's say D is in the kernel of V, then first, D is in R over J, right? D is actually uh, D plus J. But meanwhile, what we do know is phi, if you try to map D plus J to D plus I, then that means D is also, well, inside of this, uh, 
D is also inside of this R. Okay. So that means, okay, this D, you can think is actually in this uh, equivalent class as well. Right, because your D, your representative element is in I. Then of course D is in this I over J as an equivalent class of J. I equivalent class of this I over J. Right. So we are done. Sorry, but what what what's the logistic behind like D is belong to, D is uh, element in J and D is element in I and D is uh, element in the quotient of I over J. I, I I'm not well the, the 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 logic here is uh, well um, actually you're right I shouldn't write it that way I should say the equivalent class of D is in I over J. Sorry, you see the equivalent class of D is uh, D plus J. D is an element on R, okay? And then we know that D is also an element in I. So, of course, the equivalent class, the equivalent class of D is actually in this I over J. Okay, is that clear? Is that clear? Mm. Well, I was thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you have to figure out, well, what's the difference between an element on this ring and an element on this caution ring, okay? An element on this ring means, uh, well, you are, you are element, right? But an element on this caution ring, that means it is the equivalent class, okay? And then for this equivalent class, if this representative element has some property, then we can say that, okay, it's in a smaller equivalent class, okay, by definition. So this third isomorphism theorem, it just tells you, okay, if you have more conditions on two ideals, like this condition, one is a subset of another, then you can actually do more more than the second one. Okay, we can compare that. We can compare the second one and the third one. They both talk about the relation between ideals. But the second one say that, okay, whatever, whatever two ideals, you always have this relation. The third one says that, okay, you can actually do some cancellation as long as one is inside the other. Okay. Any question about this part? This is very theoretical. This part is really theoretical. And the application at this moment, um, I'm not really able to show you because the application are over too complicated. Uh, most of them are really too complicated. Uh, the easiest one is something I found on the, well, you'll see on the midterm tonight, okay? Question? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think I am a little confused by mm -hmm. I over J synthesis. Can we explain it again? Of course. So why this is a curve? Why this I over J is a kernel? Well, D as an equivalent class in this kernel of phi. Remember, the kernel of phi must be, well, as a set, a subset of this R over J, right? R over J contains a lot of equivalent class. So the kernel of phi contains a lot of equivalent class, which we write it as a D plus J, right? As an equivalent class. Okay, uh, if this is really hard for you to, to think about, maybe you can also think, what is J? J, let's say it's, uh, well, I, I is a uh, 3Z, okay? J is 60. Then in this, in this case, then that means 
D plus I means uh, you have a you have a you have a number which can be written as three K plus uh, plus plus B, and this D can be written as six K plus D, okay, as an equivalent class. Then we map this uh, well three K plus uh, well six uh, K plus D to be a three K plus D, and then it turns out that this 3k plus d is, uh, well, d is actually in 3k. d is a multiple of 3 because it's, uh, it's equals to 0. 0 plus 3 is 3k. So d is actually a multiple of 3, right? So that means d must be able to write as uh, 3m plus 6k. The equivalent class d can be written as 3m plus 6k. Right. Or on the other word, well, D as an equivalent class is in I over J. It's not a whole ring over J. It's not a whole ring as a, as a whole ring will uh, divide by J and you get some equivalent class, but it's some, something very restricted. It's not everything over J, but something very restricted over J. Because the representative element, you know that is in I. Okay. Any, okay. Mm -hmm. Think about it. And uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Try to think about it. And uh, well, any other question? Or you want me to well to explain it again? This part I agree is very confusing. Yeah, because you have to be very clear about what's the meaning of the quotient of the ring, and you must be able to figure out what is the element of such kind of thing. What is the element of this, and what's the difference between the element on this ring and on this ring? Okay, the whole thing is R, and uh, you have something smaller, which is I, and then you have something smallest, uh, which is uh, J. Then R models J. Then, of course, it has a equivalent class subset, which is I over J. Okay, you know, in some other words, this kind of uh, quotient of equivalent class, it's more or less like a subtraction or something like that, although it's not really. Any other question? Okay, so then that's all about the ring. Ring, I have to say, the ring theory uh, on this uh, abstract algebra is actually something if you don't uh, talk about the uh, field split, splitting field and field extension, um, it's not really the something, it's not really something hard, I have to say. It's not something really hard in abstract algebra. Instead, I think the group theory is even harder. It's even harder than the field theory. I think the group theory is the hardest one because uh, you have the least condition about the group um, and uh, then you have a lot of, lot of examples of group you need to study. So today, uh, the rest of today's class, I will briefly introduce what is a group, okay? The definition of groups and I'll provide you a lot of examples of groups which might be quite important in your future study because group is something that is really useful. You can see that ring for ring theory is basically talks about uh, the polynomials and integers and the factorization, this kind of thing. But for, well, so it's not relevant to the real life. But for group, it's really, really useful. You can see, okay? By the way, so for the midterms, I'll not talk about, well, I'll not assume you know anything, well, I'll not test anything on group 
okay? So only ring theory. So the rest of today's class will not be on the exam, today's exam. Question? Yeah, so for the group part, uh, first, we will not mention too much on the group. And the second, it will not, uh, well, if, uh, if, if I use something in the midterms, I will, I will explain it to you, or I will, I, will, I, will, I will be sure that you know that. It's something pretty basic, okay? But whatever, let's see what is a group. You can see that in today's lecture, we don't have a lot of things about groups. But as, let's see, what is a group? Group, it has, it's actually something simpler than, well, simpler than the rings. It has a simple, it has a simpler structure. What I'm going to say is a group is actually a ring. It contains two operations, right? But the group, it only contains one operations and we will concentrate on this one operations. Let me first write down the definition of groups. A group is a set G it represents the group which closed under an operation. For the group, we always use a multiplication. Or if you do want, you can also use addition. But uh, we don't really use addition in general groups. Because in a group, we don't assume that it's commutative. This operation is commutative. or with dot. So that, well, this group, this group operation, it satisfied three conditions. One, if A, B in G, A, B, C in G, then A, B times C is equals to A times B times C which means it's a short associative. This is very important. Otherwise, we cannot work. And second, if you consider a group, then this, uh, well, this operation, this markation, it must have an identity element. It must have an identity element on this uh, group. Uh, a times E equals to E times A equals to A for any A in G, okay? Identity must exist. And the third one is if A in G, then the inverse of this element exist. We use A inverse because we use a multiplication, so it's A inverse, inverse of G or inverse of A satisfy A times A inverse equals to A inverse times A equals to A. Okay? Uh, remember, we have to we have to do this two signs. Otherwise, uh, well, it's not complete because we don't assume that this G, this uh, multiplication, commute, commute, commutative. Okay, but if this uh, well, this uh, multiplication commutative is commutative, we call this G a billion. Well, name after Abel. if A times B equals to B times A, or A, B, in G. I think I already know who is Abel, right? He's, a, he's also a very famous mathematician, just like the Galois, although he's a little bit older than, older than Galois, but still he's pretty young. I think he has this kind of result just, uh, well, 
maybe a couple years older than he, he built the, the, this foundation of abstract algebra, this group theory. Okay, so this is basically his definition. It's quite simple. You have an operation on a set. This operation is associative and uh, it has an identity element. Every element has an inverse. That's enough. Then we will have a group. Uh, and by the way, so in the future, you may also, uh, you may also see some other kind of, uh, well, group, not really group. For instance, if you do not have this kind of, uh, uh, well, yeah, let's, uh, let's ignore that. I think I, I shouldn't mention this because that will be a uh, whole day, okay? So basically, this is uh, these three conditions form the definition of group. Okay. I can ask a question. Sure. So, in the definition, is it an operation defined, or the operation need to be specifically the multiplication? Well, this operation is some operation, and we name it as a multiplication. Okay. So it's not necessary to be. On the number C, uh, on the number set, and then you define its multiplication stuff. You can define this kind of uh, weird multiplication, whatever you want. Okay, and we just name it as multiplication because it's not commutative. So the multiplication can help us to remember that it's not commutative, and uh, the inverse is easier for us to write. Right, a inverse. In that case, can we like say something like, can we just say like, uh, we define addition to be multiplication and? Like, yes, of course. But the reason why we don't want much, well, we, we don't want to use addition in this, uh, in this notation is simply because if you use addition, then probably you want to say this group is a billion. If you have a billion group, then sometimes we call this multiplication to be addition, okay? to use this notation to represent it, this uh, operation on this group. But other than that, it's, uh, well, we always use a dot instead of plus to denote this operation. OK? This is just a notation, nothing more than that. You can use whatever you want. Just make sure that everybody agree with you and everybody follows you. OK? always a billion. For a billion group, you have where well, you use plus instead of multiplication. Okay? Any question? This is just a name. This is just name of the operation. Your operation could be pretty weird. Could be anything you want. Okay, for instance, uh, you may have this, uh, uh, I think for some of you, you may see this kind of problem in your high school, well, you know, college entrance exam, say that, okay, you define an operation, A something B, right? A star uh, with circle B, and uh, something like A squared plus B uh, minus B something, right? This kind of thing. Of course, this is still an operation, bin binary operation. And uh, we can define to write it as something really weird, but after all, it's just one operation. We can call it multiplication if you want, as long as it's, it satisfies this kind of operation slows. Otherwise, we don't really want to call it a um, multiplication. Okay. So let's see some examples. This would be an interesting part. Uh, for instance, well, uh, the one of the good example is, uh, for instance, you may try to study the symmetric group of a set. Which is, well, all the bijection, uh, let's say a set S on S from S to itself, and uh, well, this, 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 all this kind of uh, bijection form a group. You can see why. The bijection, okay, then of course, this bijection 
if you have F, it's from S to S, it's a bijection. And you have another G from S to S, it's a bijection. Then you can define the operation to be the composition of two bijections, right? And it's still, uh, it's still a bijection. And this composition is satisfied the associativity law, and uh, it satisfies, okay, the identity is actually the, well, it's, uh, well, it's E, is your identity element. And uh, for any bijection, of course, you have the inverse. It's just a mess. Of course, it has an inverse. And the inverse is a bijection as well, right? The inverse composed with F is identity, F composed with F inverse is also identity. Okay. Then the symmetric group seems to be very easy, but we can make a very specific one, then you will see it might be interesting. For instance, if S is a subset of Euclidean domain, oh, Euclidean well space. And then a symmetric of S is actually a motion. A symmetric means the element on the symmetric group of S. Most of all, mostly you will see this motion as a rigid body motion, okay? Which means you rotate this kind of element, but sometimes it's not really the, or everything. For instance, if you have a if you have an object, if you have an object, of course you rotate it. It's kind of uh, the bijection, and uh, if you flip it, which is you do the mirror reflection, it's also a bijection, right? Uh, it's a motion of uh, Euclidean space. For example. If you have this, uh, well, the uh, the equilateral uh, triangle, which is 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees, you have every lens has the same. This is, well, this is one, two, three. Okay, point one, point two, point three. Then what is a symmetric group? What can, what can we imagine how to move it on the plan? Well, you can try to rotate it, right? You try to rotate it, then you can rotate it once, then well, counterclockwisely. One, two, three. Okay, let's say this R, this rotate is rotate counterclockwisely. And of course, you can rotate it twice. R, R2 is actually R1 times R1. R1 composed with R1. Then you have one, two, three. Okay. And of course, you can do the reflection, the mirror reflection. And uh, well, if you do the reflection on this line, let's say it's F1, let's call it F1, then you have one, three, two. This is also a symmetric of this object, right? And uh, you can also do the reflection on this line, you keep two, and then here becomes one, here becomes three. This is F2, let's say. And of course, you can also re will reflect it on F3. This is three, two, one. Okay, so this, you can see it as an identity or let's call it a I. This doesn't change anything for this uh, triangle. This, you rotate this triangle. This one, you rotate this triangle twice. This one, you do the reflection. This one, I also do a reflection. This one, I do a reflection. Those six elements forms a set, which is a symmetric group of this triangle. Okay, let's denote it as T. Uh, this is T. Okay. And uh, you can see that it forms, uh, it forms a group. Those kind of operation, it forms a group. 
Another very good example is, well, I believe everybody know what's this, right? This is a magic cube of order two. Uh, well, to be honest, I, I don't know how to play with it uh, last week. So, uh, well, so I, I tried to search on Bilibili and then learn it. And uh, it seems that the uh, order three magic cube is over it's a little bit more complicated and we don't, we don't really use it, we don't really need it. So I try to study how to play with this second order well, magic cube. And uh, hopefully after uh, this master's class, you will know how to play it, okay? But for this magic cube of order two, basically what you can do is you can fix it like well, this is cube one, this is uh, cube number one, number two, number three, number four, and uh, number six. This is number six. This cube is number six, seven, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so you can, you can try to draw a cube and then on each edge, it just represents one, well, one small cube of this order two magic cube, right? Let's say it's one, two, three, four, and uh, five, six, seven, eight, okay? There are eight cubes. Then for this guy, for this magic cube, what we can do is we can do, there are a lot of operations that can keep this position, uh, that can be seen as a bijection. For instance, you can rotate this side, the right-hand side, well, counterclockwisely, right? Let's say it's R, which means you rotate this one counterclockwisely, or you can rotate it clockwisely, let's say it's R inverse, or R prime, whatever you want. And you can also rotate the left-hand side, well, counterclockwisely or clockwise, right? And uh, that is L and L inverse, okay? And also, well, you can rotate the top, the upper, the upper, the upper side, well, clockwisely uh, or counterclockwise. And the bottom, you can also rotate the bottom clockwisely, tying that clockwisely, or that's counterclockwisely, or clockwise, okay? So this kind of operations are the, well, most basic operations on this second order magic cube, okay? And uh, then what you can do is you can play this kind of operations and then you do some composition of these operations and then what you can do is you can somehow, well, makes it back to this, uh, this kind of, uh, well, this situation. If, uh, if we try to make it randomly, then that means you have a mix, one, well, Q, cube number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, you have a mixed one, then what you want is you use this kind of operations to forms, uh, to forms uh, a big operation so that it becomes, uh, it will go back to the standard, well, magic cube, okay? We will see more in the future about, well, how to use a group theory to represent well, how to play with this magic cube of order, okay? Hopefully you can understand it. I think I, I use like one, one hour or maybe, uh, maybe more than that to understand how to play with it. And it's not so hard since it's order two. You can also try to watch some video on Bilibili and uh, there, are, there are a lot of video on it and I'm sure you can understand it. But the hard part would be how to understand it within the group theory. Okay, how to try to explain it in some kind of operations or the group element, okay? Uh, well, let me tell you two more examples. Another example is, uh, well, for instance, 
this is cotorin groups, which is uh, something like the cotorins. You remember that we mentioned these cotorins, uh, cotorins uh, on this uh, ring theory because they can expand the whole well cotorin space, which is plus or minus one, plus or minus i, plus or minus j, and plus or minus k. Where i square is equals to j square, it's equals to k square, it's equals to minus one and i j k. It has this well this directions operation, which means i times j is equals to k, and uh, k j times k is equals to i, k times i is equals to j. But if you reverse them, then j times i is equals to minus k k times j is equals to minus i, and uh, i times k is equals to minus k. And it forms a group. Meanwhile, it's a non-abelian group, right? The multiplication is not commute. By the way, for this kind of operations, for the magic cube, it's also not, well, it's not also non-abelian. Otherwise, uh, well, the world will become much, much easier. The magic cube will not become a super hard problem. Well, at this moment, it's actually hard for me, but if it's a abelian group, then, well, we don't need to worry about it anymore. Uh, another good example is, well, so-called the permutation, the permutation group. Permutation group of set A. For instance, I gave you a, a, a set A, which is, uh, well, apple and orange. Then you change apple to orange, you change orange to apple. Then this, uh, for instance, you change the name. Then this becomes an operation between apple orange to apple orange, right? Then this becomes, uh, well, this kind of map becomes a permutation of a set A. Uh, Well, uh, in this kind of example, we always set A to be some discrete set. For instance, if A equals to one, two, and two N, this N letters or N numbers, then the symmetric group of A or the permutation group of A, we call it the symmetric group, well, the symmetric group of order N or the symmetric group on N letters. SN. You'll find that in the future, this SN is actually quite important, and you can basically find any group from this SN, which is an interesting property. Uh, well, sometimes we use the notation to denote an element on SN. Uh, which, for instance, uh, will a permutation uh, from 1 to n to 1 to n, uh, such that pi 1 equals to i1, pi 2 equals to i2, and so on, pi n equals to i n. Then sometimes we also write pi to be, you map 1 to be i1, 2 to be i2, and n to be i n as an element in SN, okay? And sometimes if it doesn't confuse you, you may even write it as I1 until I. Not always, not usually. But sometimes we will, we do use this kind of notation to denote something. Uh, okay. So let's stop here and uh, I'll have 10 minutes break. We will resume at 21, okay?